Good morning. Thank you all for being with us today. I call this hearing to order. It has been about eight years since the 2008 uh, financial crisis, and yet, for many Americans, it still feels like the economy has yet to recover. Just last year, 36 percent of counties in the United States had a negative GDP growth rate. Much of this poor economic growth can be traced, traced back to a lack of new business creation in rural America. When businesses cannot create jobs in rural America, economic growth suffers nationwide. From 2010 to 2014, half of all new businesses were started in just 20 of our nation's counties, all near large metropolitan centers. 
for these major coastal metro areas, small business growth is fairly strong. Cities like San Francisco and Miami are major hubs for business creation, and the population in these areas has reached record highs. Meanwhile, from 2010 to 2014, more Americans left non-metropolitan counties than ever before. Rural counties have also seen a net decrease in business establishment. These two forces have combined to create a lost generation of entrepreneurs in a significant portion of the United States. If the United States is to remain economically vibrant in the near future, there needs to be economic growth not in just major coastal cities, but all across America. As we've stressed time and time again in this committee, the engine of economic growth and job creation and opportunity in this country comes from small businesses. While there are several reasons for this decline in entrepreneurship in rural America, many of the initiatives this committee has focused on this Congress, including reducing regulatory burdens and improving avenues for small businesses to acquire capital, still remain at the forefront. The loss of community banks in this country due to regulatory challenges like Dodd-Frank have also hurt the rural communities served by these banks very hard. Today's hearing will be an opportunity for a distinguished panel from across the country to discuss how to promote small business growth in America's heartland. By understanding how small businesses can be successful in rural areas like my district in Kansas, we can not only improve the economic growth of the entire country, but create the businesses and the products of the future right at home. I thank the witnesses for being here this morning. Uh, we look forward to your testimony. I now yield to Ranking Member Chu for an opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, six years ago, the nation was in the early stages of a, a recovery from one of the worst economic downturns in history. We lost four million jobs, seven million people faced foreclosure, and families saw over $16 trillion in wealth disappear as the housing and stock markets crashed. Now, as a nation, we have rebounded. Unemployment is below 5%. Over 10 million new jobs have been created. We've reached record highs in the stock market and retirement portfolios. New consumer protection laws have been implemented, and consumers are confident that the United States is recovering. But we must acknowledge that this recovery has not been perfect. In fact, it is unlike any recovery that we've seen before. For example, the smallest rural counties saw more business establishments close and open, resulting in a negative growth rate. As a result, the U.S. economy is becoming more reliant on a small number of super-performing counties for new institutions. As a matter of fact, only 20 counties were responsible for half of the net national increase in business establishments from 2010 to 2014. In contrast, the economic expansion of the 1990s was driven by more rural economic development, where in counties under 100,000 people average 16% job growth, while counties over 1 million average just 7.7%. A look at why rural America is struggling shows a number of causes. Over the last two decades, there have been massive manufacturing job loss in areas that were once the epicenter for manufacturing in America. The U.S. lost 5 million manufacturing jobs between January 2000 and December 2014. The North America Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, also resulted in a $181 billion trade deficit with Mexico and Canada, and experts estimate it has cost us approximately 1 million American jobs. Furthermore, studies have shown that the rural population is increasing while jobs are decreasing, forcing young, talented workers to leave for urban areas with better job opportunities. These factors have created an atmosphere that is not attractive to entrepreneurs and one that we in Congress must work to turn around. While the problem and its many causes are clear, we must assess what solutions are possible. Fortunately, congressional Democrats have taken steps to address these conditions. For instance, Congressman Hoyer's Made in America plan includes enhancing vocational training, expanding entrepreneurship and innovation, and matching worker skills with job opportunities. These ideals are accomplished by investing in education, providing access to capital for small institutions, as well as alleviating tax and regulatory burdens. Another area of great importance is access to capital. During the recession, many entrepreneurs have struggled to receive the funding necessary to open a new business or expand an existing one. As shown in research, young firms are where most new jobs are created, and the lack of capital has directly led to a slower recovery in rural areas. 
Congress has put forth solutions to rectify this issues. Uh, for example, I spearheaded changes to the SBA's 504 loan program, which freed up more capital <clears throat> for small firms. The 504 program is a useful financing tool for economic growth that provides small business with long-term fixed-rate loans. By making the 504 refinancing program permanent, more small businesses will be able to reduce debt, increase liquidity, and ultimately create new jobs. Looking ahead, we need to gain an even better understanding of the extent of the problem and its root causes. Bringing new and innovative ideas to Congress will help us shape public policy to revitalize rural America. I thank the witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to your comments. I yield back. Thank the ranking member for uh, her opening comments. And now I'd like to introduce our first witness this morning, John Deary, author of Where the Jobs Are, Entrepreneurship and the Soul of the American Economy. His book was uh, published in 2013 and focuses on the fact that job creation and economic growth in this country are largely dependent on new business formation. Mr. Deary is also the acting CEO of the Financial Services Forum in Washington, D.C and is a member of the Policy Council at the Economic Innovation Group. Mr. Deere, you have five minutes, and you may begin. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chairman Hulskamp and Ranking Mem Member Chu. Uh, 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 the views I'll be expressing today are my own, of course. Since emerging from the Great Recession more than seven years ago, the U.S. economy has grown as, at an average annual rate of just 2.2 percent, more than a per full percentage point slower than the post-World War II average of 3.4 percent. Indeed, the U.S. economy has not grown at 3 percent or better since 2005. In an economy the size of the U.S. economy, percentage points matter. Had the U.S. economy grown at 3.5 percent since emerging from the Great Recession in 2009, GDP last year alone would have been more than $1 trillion greater. Over a 25-year period, the difference between a U.S. economy growing at 2.2 percent versus 3.5 percent is more than $100 trillion in additional economic output. Weak economic growth experienced since 2005 is the principal cause, in my view, of America's most serious challenges, including persistently high unemployment and underemployment, high and rising long-term debt, stagnant wages, wide and worsening income, wealth, and opportunity inequality, the highest poverty rate since the mid-60s, and record numbers of Americans reliant on government programs like food stamps and disability insurance. To meaningfully address these challenges and the anger, cynicism, and populism they inspire, we must accelerate economic growth back to the historical average of 3.5 percent on a sustained basis. In 1957, American economist Robert Solow demonstrated that most of economic growth cannot be attributed to increases in capital and labor, as most economists had previously believed, but rather only to gains in productivity driven by innovation. The great significance of Solow's work is that it not only had defined the nature of economic growth, it also identified its principal source. That's because economists have long understood that innovation, uh, particularly major or disruptive innovation, comes disproportionately from new businesses or startups. Unfortunately, as scholars at the Kauffman Foundation, the Brookings Institution, and elsewhere have documented, entrepreneurship in America is in trouble. After remaining remarkably consistent for decades, the number of new businesses launched in the United States peaked in 2006 and then began a precipitous decline, a decline accelerated by the Great Recession. Perhaps most alarming, the number of new firms as a percentage of all firms has fallen near a 30-year low, and this decline is occurring across a broad range of industry sectors, including high tech, and in all 50 states. Circumstances in rural areas of America, as you alluded to in your opening statements, are particularly uh, worrisome. A recent report by the Economic Innovation Group shows that most of the new business formation that has occurred since the Great Recession has been concentrated in high-density urban or suburban areas. Indeed, since 2009, small counties have experienced net negative growth in the number of business establishments in their area. Such circumstances amount to nothing short of a national emergency. To find out why startup rates are falling, a colleague and I uh, conducted roundtables with entrepreneurs in 12 cities across the United States, asking them quite simply, what's in your way? Here's what they told us. We have the jobs, and we need to fill them in order to, to survive and grow. We cannot find enough people that have the skills that we need. 
our immigration policies don't effectively attract and retain the world's best and most innovative talent. Access to startup capital is even more tough in the wake of the financial crisis. Overregulation is killing us. Tax complexity and uncertainty is diverting far too much of our time and attention away from our new businesses, our products and services. Finally, there is too much economic uncertainty, and it's Washington's fault. It's the bickering and partisanship, the fiscal cliff, the debt ceiling, the government shutdowns, the inability to achieve tax reform or immigration reform or to effectively deal with the national debt. Washington, they told us at roundtable after roundtable, is a generator of problems, not solutions, and it is killing the economy. With those insights in mind, my colleague and I developed a 30-point policy plan for unleashing the growth and job-creating capacity of the entrepreneurial economy based on what American entrepreneurs told us they need. The complete list of those proposals are in the appendix to my written testimony, and I'm happy to answer any questions about them. Economic growth is driven by gains in productivity, which are driven by innovation, which, come dis which comes disproportionately from new businesses. Revitalization of American entrepreneurship, therefore, is the essential pathway to faster economic growth and the nation's ability to meaningfully address its most serious socioeconomic problems. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Thank you, Ms. Deary. We appreciate uh, your testimony. Uh, and our next witness is Robert Boyd, a Riley County Commissioner for my district in Manhattan, Kansas. This morning he will be testifying on behalf of the National Association of Counties. Mr. Boyd is a, in his first term as County Commissioner, was elected in November of 2012. He also owns a dry cleaning business in the district. Mr. Boyd, I thank you for being here today. Also, thank you for your service as a combat veteran on behalf of our country. And you may begin your testimony. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Chairman Hulskamp, uh, Ranking Member Chu, and members of the subcommittee, my name is Robert Boyd and I serve on the Board of County Commissioners for Riley County, Kansas. I'm here today representing the National Association of Counties. As both a county elected official and small business owner, I'm honored to participate in today's hearing. Located in northeast Kansas, Riley County has a mix of both rural and urban areas. Manhattan is our largest city and county seat. We have over 75,000 residents and are home to Fort Riley and Kansas State University, two major economic engines for our region. We often hear that the U.S. economy is recovering from the Great Recession, but it's hard to feel this recovery on the ground in our state and counties. National and statewide economic data do not always paint an accurate picture of the local situation because every county has its own unique challenges and opportunities. To provide a national perspective on the state of uh, county economic conditions, National Association County releases County e Economies, an annual report on economic recovery and growth patterns across the nation's 3,069 county economies. The report looks at annual changes in four economic performance indicators in each county, economic output or GDP, employment, unemployment rates, and medium home prices. In 2015, counties across the country showed some signs of economic recovery particularly on unemployment and uh, home prices. For instance, more than 400 county economies closed their unemployment gaps and saw their home prices reach pre-recession levels. On the other hand, only 7% of county economies have fully recovered to pre-recession levels on all four indicators, and 16% have yet to recover on any of the four economic indicators. In other words, many counties are still experiencing the recession. The outlook for our nation's small and rural counties is even more challenging. 70% of counties are considered small with populations less than 50,000. Of those, only about 300 small county economies closed their unemployment gaps in 2015. Furthermore, almost half small county economies saw a decline in GDP, particularly those in the South and the Midwest. In Kansas, 100 out of 105 county economies saw job losses or flat employment. That, let me repeat that. 100 out of 105 counties saw job losses or flat employment. Only one county, one of the county economies in the state saw higher job growth. Additionally, over 60% experienced a decline in GDP. In Riley County, we've only recovered in GDP and home prices, but are still struggling with jobs and unemployment rates. Many of our surrounding counties are experiencing an even slower recovery. None of our six neighboring counties have recovered all four indicators, on all four indicators. Most of them saw declines in GDP and jobs. 
And we're not alone. Many rural counties face similar headwinds. At the same time, small county governments must uh, provide mandatory service and comply with the same regulations as our suburban and urban counterparts. We, and we have to do it all with limited ability to generate revenue and without economic uh, economies of scale. While we face serious challenges, we are addressing these issues and strengthening our communities. We are supporting uh, small business incubators and training programs, facilitating access to capital, and making major investment in critical local infrastructure. All of our ec efforts are aimed at fostering conditions for economic growth and improving the quality of life. In Riley County, we've partnered with Fort Riley, Kansas State University, the Kansas Department of Transportation, the U.S. Department of Transportation, and other local governments in the region to develop the Flint Hills Area Trans Transportation Agency. This collaboration helps to connect our people to jobs, education, and health care. Programs like this help small businesses like mine to tap into regional workforce and position us for future growth. In conclusion, while some county economies have seen improvements, there are still a long way to go, especially for small rural counties. With improved collaboration and flexibility from our intergovernmental partners at the federal and state levels, we can continue to provide the public services and basic infrastructure needed for economic growth and prosperity. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Commissioner Boyd. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you for being with us here today. Or I now yield to Congressman Trent Kelly for the introduction of our third witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our third witness this morning is Hugh Middleton, co-founder of Copus Mobile in Flowood, Mississippi. Although Copus Mobile is located in my colleague, uh, Mr. Harper's district, one of the co-founders, uh, Henry Jones, is a fellow graduate of my alma mater, Ole Miss, which is in my district also. Uh, started in 2009, Copus Mobile designs apps and app-enabled equipment for the Department of Defense, law enforcement, and private security markets. They are represented today by co-founder Mr. Hugh Middleton, a former Navy SEAL officer. Thank you for your service to our country and for being here this morning, Mr. Middleton, and you may begin. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good morning, Chairman Holskamp, Ranking Member Chu, and members of the committee. Thank you for hosting this hearing on the challenges of small businesses faced in rural America and for your invitation to provide remarks at this hearing. My name is Hugh Middleton. I am co-founder of Copus Mobile, a small startup co tech company headquartered in Flowood, Mississippi. Flowood's located just outside of Jackson, Mississippi. Before I get into what Copus Mobile does, I'd like to provide a little background about myself that I feel is part pertinent to the work that we do. I'm a former Navy SEAL officer. While on the SEAL teams, I was assigned to SEAL teams one, three, five, six, and spent time in various overseas assignments, including special operations joint staffs. I've also worked in several U.S. embassies and consulates. I separated from the Navy in 2005, taking the management position in a large defense contracting company that supported then on ongoing operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. Following that, I moved on to another defense company where I managed a staff of highly skilled intelligence analysts conducting intelligence and data exploitation focused on improvised explosive devices, uh, threat characterization. In January 2013, I co-founded Copus Mobile with three super smart engineers who all worked at the same company that I did at the time. It may seem like an odd pairing of backgrounds, and you're correct, it is. We often can't understand what the other is saying, but we've made it work to develop some very leading-edge products that didn't exist prior to us starting the company. Copus Mobile is a unique position, in a unique position as a provider of advanced mobile technology and products for the Department of Defense, law enforcement agencies, and the private security industry. We develop mobile technology to minimize the weight and enhance the equipment of soldiers, first responders, and law enforcement officers. This technology saves lives, saves time, and saves money. What we do is vitally important, especially to me, because I was on the other side of the fence at one time. I witnessed how long it takes to get the right equipment because of the overburdened bureaucracy of the procurement process. For a small company like us, it really is a killer. We have equipment, uh, we have equipment quotes sitting in the hands of military units for over six months before they're able to obligate funds for critically needed items. The problem is the same for first responders. The process is, uh, equates to birthing a baby. It takes nine months often to get through the grant process for them to obligate funds to buy, again, critically needed items. As with any startup business, it's been a struggle for us. I'll go out on a limb and say it's been harder for us given the industry that we're in. Not only are we a tech company from rural Mississippi, but we also have been trying to gain access into an industry dominated by the likes of Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, 
and Lockheed Martin. We've spent over three years just trying to educate people on who we are and what we do. We obviously don't have any buildings with Copus Mobile on the top of them across from the Pentagon. Most senior leaders think that because of digitization that they're more productive because of less paperwork. Actually, the opposite is happening. They have more paperwork than ever, and this translates to a 3% decrease in annual productivity within the military. Bureaucracy is increasing faster than automation, which means that over the past 20 years, nearly half the military's productivity has been sucked dry by the time vampires of administrative tasks. The federal government spends about $20 billion a year on development of later stage technology for commercialization. Majority of this money is spent in large acquisition programs that incorporate technology that is not proven, which means the equipment takes way too long to get to the warfighter. This results in huge cost overruns, frustrated operators, and projects that are way behind schedule. The reason for this, most new technology dies on the vine because of the bureaucracy of the military. The GAO said technologies do not leave the lab because their potential has not been adequately demonstrated. And the DOD is simply unwilling to fund final stages of development of a promising technology, preferring to invest in other aspects of the program that are viewed as more vital to success. And the DOD's budgeting process requires investments to be targeted at least two years in advance of their activation which makes it difficult for DOD to seize opportunities to introduce technological advances into acquisition programs. The problem is only 5.71% of new te technology ever gets into the hands of those that really need it. That's four out of every 70 projects. When you realize that small business accounts for 99.7% of all new technology introduced, it becomes incredibly important for small businesses to be involved in technology, technology development and transfer. The Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology Logistics reported the federal government has missed its small business goals for the last 16 years, despite the fact that buying from small business is far less painful. Frankly, buying from small guys like us eliminates red tape, shortens the technology transfer, speeds the time to get the operator equipment they really need, and makes life for the contracting officer easier. What this really means is that it's vitally important to partner with small businesses who direct who talk directly to operators in order to co-create useful technology. I'm sure you're already aware, small businesses are the backbone of the country. We create opportunity, generate jobs, invent new technology, and keep the economy going. We do all of this while being over-regulated, over-taxed, and under-supported by the federal government. Everything from Obamacare to mountains of paperwork are hindrances to the growth and health of a small business. With lower taxes and health care costs, we could hire more people, increase salaries, and bring better talent to Mississippi. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Middleton. We appreciate your testimony. I next yield to Ms. Chu for introduction of our, our next, uh, next witness. It's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Lindsley Kincaid, Deputy Director of U.S. Programs at Winrock International. In this role, Ms. Kincaid is responsible for developing and implementing uh, entrepreneurship community and workforce development projects in underserved areas. These projects work directly with disadvantaged populations seeking training and support to enter the workforce and have led to the employment of more than 200 previously unemployed or underemployed Arkansans to date. She is a certified professional community and economic developer and also chairs the Central Advisory Board at the Community Development Institute. Prior to joining Winrock, Ms. Kincaid spent a number of years on Capitol Hill working for Representative Vic Snyder and Senator Blanche Lincoln. She has a bachelor's degree in journalism and po political science uh, degree from the University of Arkansas. Chairman Hulescamp, Ranking Member Chu, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. My name is Lindsley Kincaid and I'm the Deputy Director of U.S. Programs at Winrock International. Winrock is a nonprofit organization that works with people in the United States and around the world to empower the disadvantaged, increase economic opportunity, and sustain natural resources. Winrock is based in Little Rock, Arkansas, the home state of our namesake, former governor, and Arkansas's original economic developer, Winthrop Rockefeller. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss innovative and sustainable economic and community development models taking a place across rural America. Winrock's U.S. programs is extensively involved in developing solutions for the challenges facing rural communities. Our on-the-ground technical assistance to community leaders, 
local organizations, has been funded by grants and cooperative agreements from agencies and partners such as the United States Department of Agriculture, the Delta Regional Authority, the United States Department of Labor, the State of Arkansas, the Kellogg Foundation, and the Walton Family Foundation. Winrock is based in Little Rock, Arkansas. The heart of a six county metropolitan region which accounts for fewer than 720,000 people. Compared to large counties in Florida, New York, or Texas, our metro area is certainly rural. However, Arkansas is home to more than 500 cities, with only 22 having a population above 20,000, and only 60 cities with a population above 5,000, thereby making the Little Rock metro area one of Arkansas's most urban environments. Winrock has seen successful economic and community development models blossom in both our urban and rural areas. The Arkansas Women's Business Center, based in El Dorado, Arkansas, which is a city of a population of about 18,000, provides technical assistance and training tailored to meet the needs of women business owners across the state. Funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the Small Business Administration, since 2011, the Women's Business Center has provided training to more than 700 clients, helped 35 new businesses start, and assisted companies that have created 65 jobs. The Innovate Arkansas Initiative, funded by the State of Arkansas through its Economic Development Commission, convenes startup technology entrepreneurs in Arkansas and works with them as they become mature companies. Since 2008, Innovate Arkansas clients have launched more than 150 startups, created more than 600 jobs, and received more than $295 million in public and private investment. Entrepreneurs and business owners in these programs are provided quality training, counseling, access to capital, and other resources needed to empower and equip them to ensure business success with the ultimate goal of creating a sustainable entrepreneurial ecosystem. The Innovation Hub at Winrock is a perfect example of an innovative and broad-based approach to talent and enterprise development that can be applied to rural and urban communities alike. The Innovation Hub provides facilities and programs that support education and entrepreneurship for all age groups across a, across a wide range of disciplines. The Innovation Hub has planned, developed, and administered a broad array of entrepreneurial programs including HubX Life Sciences, a privately funded world-class healthcare accel accelerator program that recently completed its initial cohort with seven highly accomplished companies from across the world. Those seven companies leveraged approximately $2 million of private capital from Arkansas-based investors. Economic development occurs in communities where people can live, work, and grow. The revitalization of main streets and courthouse squares across rural America can be the catalyst for new community investment. For example, municipal leaders in Lake Village, Arkansas, a community of about 2,500, recently realized that to compete and grow the redevelopment of downtown was critical. By combining more than $2 million in funding from various federal and state agencies and the city's own coffers, the city renovated a dilapidated downtown, downtown historic structure on its main street into a LEED certified municipal building housing all city services. The project increased, increased downtown foot traffic and convinced investors to renovate nearby buildings to house new small businesses interested in a downtown location. Our rural communities remain hopeful for the future, coupling innovative entrepreneurship programs with quality of life and placemaking place revitalization efforts can bring increased economic development in urban and rural areas alike. Chairman Hewell's camp ranking member Chu, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for having me here today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Kincaid. I appreciate uh, your testimony. Uh, we will now begin our questioning and I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, uh, first, uh, Commissioner Boyd, uh, uh, representing a rural county, uh, at least rural by definition of uh, 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 nationally. Uh, could you provide some insight, uh, particularly from uh, yourself as a small businessman, uh, uh, the challenges of operating a rural county uh, in, in, in light of some of the difficulties we've uh, discussed here today? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very good question. We do struggle uh, operating uh, a small county uh, today. We have... Uh, Partnerships, uh, economic partnerships with uh, private enterprises. We do economic development with our uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Manhattan Area Chamber of Commerce. They provide our economic development uh, guidance and uh, activities. We also struggle with uh, things such as uh, uh, labor, the recent labor uh, uh, 
uh, legislation that takes effect here in, in December uh, is going to be a, a burden on us. Uh, it's a burden on the, uh, the small business. It's going to change how I do business. It's going to change how my people do it, uh, change the uh, 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 county's em employment. We also struggle with uh, uh, regulations. We are, uh, in the dry cleaning business, we are seeing huge increases in, in uh, uh, disposal fees that we are required to maintain. We're seeing uh, things such as, uh, uh, in the county, things such as uh, uh, waters of the U.S. that are, are impacting us as we go forward. So it's a, it is a struggle. What we need is partnerships, things such as uh, working with us in formulating some of these, these challenges as you go forward. Uh, each one of these people that have addressed us today uh, are known to their local governments. We can help you partner as we go forward, uh, creating legislation that helps us uh, to be the economic engines that we are. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Deary. A question, in, as, as you point out in your testimony, uh, across America there are more deaths than births of uh, new businesses. So if you had to pick one particular category amongst the litany of complaints, and most of them were centered around uh, problems in Washington, if you had to pick one that uh, if we could change one that would have the most impact, what, what would it be? It's a very good question, a very hard one to answer. Um, um, I think uh, I'd start by answering, um, it's very important to keep in mind the simple things that startups need to thrive, entrepreneurs need to thrive. They, they need great new ideas, they need the talent and the capital uh, to pursue those ideas, uh, and they need as few distractions, uh, particularly unnecessary distractions uh, with regard to um, uh, regulatory and tax burden, complexity, uncertainty, et cetera because as, as new businesses, they simply don't have the resources or the time that existing businesses, even existing small businesses, might have. Things of the sort that uh, uh, my, my colleague j uh, just described, uh, that can be uh, significant headaches uh, to existing small businesses can kill new businesses, even viable new businesses, simply because uh, very often it's three or four folks around a conference room table and they're trying to focus on their new their new product, their new service, and to penetrate the, uh, the market. And anything that takes their eye off the ball uh, it, uh, dramatically increases the chances that they can fail. If there were, um, if, if there was one thing, if, if I were forced to mention one thing, which is the nature of your question, and I appreciate that, um, I would say uh, 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 I'd create a dual category, and that is, um, is this unnecessary distraction uh, that I was just mentioning, and it's, it's regulatory and tax-related burden, uncertainty, and complexity. Um, the, the, the other categories of needs in terms of new ideas and the talent and capital to pursue them are incredibly important, of course, uh, but if, if we had to focus on one thing that I think would provide enormous re uh, relief and increase the chances of new business formation, survival, and growth, it would be to pursue the idea that we put forward, my colleague and I, in our, our list of, uh, of proposals, and that is to create a, uh, a preferential, if you will, a regulatory and tax framework treatment for new businesses during the critical first five years. R uh, research shows that, that if new businesses can survive those first five years, the chances of them surviving lo long term go way up. You don't want to kill new businesses in the cradle, as it were, by burdening them with unnecessary regulatory and tax burden, complexity, and certainty. So we propose a streamlined, stripped down, and on-ramp to viability. If I were forced to pick one thing, I think that's what, what it would be. Thank you. I appreciate that testimony. Next, I recognize uh, Ms. Chu for her five minutes of questions. Ms. Kincaid, <clears throat> today the uh, largest counties in the U.S. have produced 58% of the country's new businesses. The largest counties also produced more than twice as many jobs during the 2010 recovery as they did in past recoveries. Are there any economic philosoph philosophies that you believe can be taken from urban areas and implemented in rural areas to spur growth? Yes, absolutely. One thing we've seen quite successful across the state of Arkansas is focusing on industry clusters in regions, whether that be an urban area or a rural area, 
working with industry that's already existing in a community and discovering what businesses are needed and suppliers are needed to continue to have that business in, in your community. Um, when you look at it that way, you're not only creating new small business opportunities, but you're also pre providing business retention and expansion programs for industry that already exist by creating a community where that, communi that industry can stay and thrive and grow. Um, and access to capital, of course, is extremely important for these small businesses to uh, grow and to be maintained. Uh, so um, in your opinion, what can be done to improve rural small businesses' access to capital? Access to capital is obviously a critical component of all small business development, and in rural areas it can be a challenge. We've seen micro lending programs work in smaller areas where, where uh, small businesses that don't need large loans or may not yet be bankable are, are receiving smaller funds from organizations that are able to provide the need for the startup capital to get a business going. Um, I would also say developing venture capital in rural communities, uh, angel investors, is extremely important as we get out into our rural areas. And Arkansas is a, overall a rural state, so you could have venture capital funds across the state that may, may also provide funding into more uh, urban and rural areas alike. Now, um, there are several programs that have been created at the state level that help to finance small businesses. For example, the Rural Entrepreneurship Assistance Program, REAP, has provided uh, services to numerous small businesses throughout Nebraska. Uh, REAP has placed over $10 million in loans and leveraged over $17 million in additional funds from other sources. Uh, can you describe this model in more detail, and in your opinion, does this program provide a realistic and effective model for other states to emulate? Absolutely. Access to capital in any form, whether from the state, federal, or local private investors is critical to small business development. Um, I find those programs to be extremely successful across the state, across the South in particular. Um, so I would say yes, that is a model that could very well be uh, addressed in, in states and across the federal and state governments. Um, Mr. Middleton, uh, because of uh, their capital intensive needs and the cost of new technology, small manufacturers frequently encounter what economists call the valley of death. And that is the period in the early stages of development where it becomes difficult to move past the nation startup phase and enter into the mass production phase. As a technology company outside of Silicon Valley, what was your experience with growth and expansion? No, it's as I said in my testimony. It's been it's been quite a struggle for us again because of the the industry that we're in. Uh, it's dominated by very very large companies that have lobby up here in D.C. We, we don't have any of that, um, and the fact that we are literally inventing new technology for soldiers and first responders. Uh, you know, again, we we spent a great deal of time just traveling around trying to educate people on who we are and what we do, and and the battle of of that new technology and trying to introduce it into the D.O.D. And, and sidestep the large acquisition programs because what we do revolves around smartphones and tablets and you know new, new phones come out every six months. And by the time a soldier tells us what a requirement is, what one of their pain points are, we develop a product that will fix, uh, fix that, make them more efficient and save them money. By the time it gets to them, it's already out of date uh, and it, it's, it's useless to them. So for us, it would be great to eliminate some of the roadblocks to get this new technology to first responders and, and to the DOD members, especially the folks out on the pointy end of the spear uh, that are out there running around in some pretty bad places in the world, to be able to get them these critically needed technology uh, pieces of gear to them as fast as possible. Thank you, and uh, my time is up, so I appreciate it. Next, I rec uh, recognize uh, Congressman Trent Kelly for uh, his five minutes of questions. I wanted to first thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the staff and members of the Small Business Committee for reaching out to rural America and specifically to witnesses like these who represent uh, most of our districts and our small business owners. So I uh, just wanted to thank you all. We regularly hear from small businesses that testify uh, before us uh, about the bureaucracy is a, such a great impediment to small businesses working with the federal government. Mr. Middleton, I'll summarize, but you note in your testimony an interesting observation 
that in an ever-increasing digitized world, there's actually more paperwork than ever before. Uh, your quote, uh, bureaucracy is increasing faster than automation. Uh, I would uh, imagine that the bureaucracy plays a large part of DOD, as you mentioned in your testimony, being unwilling to fund final stages of development of a promising technology. What specific improvements would businesses like yours like to see with technology development programs to encourage more small businesses to do business with the federal government? There's really got to be an incentive for doing a business, uh, business with the federal government. For We are in the business that we do because of my background, and our goal is, is to increase uh, the survivability of soldiers and first responders, uh, again, to make them more efficient and try to make them save more money. And it's just, there are so many roadblocks that impede a small company like us that a lot of them, and there's been all kinds of things in the press that small tech companies refuse to do business with the federal government because of these hurdles. It's far easier, easier in the commercial world to develop a product and get it out quickly. Uh, there's funding, uh, there's less bureaucracy, less roadblocks, and there is a need there. We know there's a need within the military and, and first responder environments, uh, but the roadblocks that we, we face, uh, we fortunately have been able to sidestep somewhat um, and be able to get around uh, just frankly because of the people that I know and be able to, to get in and, uh, and talk to folks that I used to serve with that have helped us out significantly. But if a company uh, the size of ours doesn't have a person like me, they, their chances of survivability are significantly decreased. And this question is to all of you. If you can just uh, briefly respond, maybe one or two or three examples, uh, very briefly, so each of you get to respond. What are some of the largest barriers to entry for new businesses, and are rural businesses more affected by these barriers than their urban counterparts? And so, again, just one or two examples from each of you. We can start with you, Ms. Kincaid. I think one of the largest barriers is one of the things we've already addressed today, which is access to capital. Small businesses are growing. Uh, finding the resources to get that business started, as, as my colleagues have mentioned today, is one of the most critical components and one of the hardest things to address in rural America. We were super fortunate that we, we had some investors. We raised a little bit of money, uh, and we were able to take advantage of, uh, of a small loan from the state of Mississippi. Um, uh, Again, because of our background and, and folks willing to take a chance on a small company like us, a uh, tech company. But w with a company like ours in, in Mississippi, it's exceptionally hard to, to bring talent. Um, there's a preconceived notion about Mississippi, you know, country backwoods, and it's, it's absolutely not the case. Uh, there's exceptionally smart people. We hire, we're currently hiring folks out of Old Miss and uh, Mississippi State that are brilliant young folks. And uh, we're just fortunate that we have access to that type of thing. But again, if you don't have that, you're, you're really way behind the power curve. Mr. Middleton, just to your point, uh, I tell people all the time, my area in North Mississippi is one of the fastest growing industry and tech companies coming all the time. And uh, we can't get people to come. They come down kicking and screaming. And the problem is, once they come there, we can't get them to leave, man. They want to retire there and stay there forever. So, uh, you know, it, it is a miss. Uh, the, the press has a tendency to show things that are negative towards Mississippi. But the people who come there love the people, love the place, love the environment, and they stay there. So thank you for that comment, Mr. Boyd. Thank you, sir. That's a very good question. Um, I agree with Ms. Kincaid that uh, uh, financing is, is the number one uh, hurdle that a small business has to overcome. Second uh, is uh, creating a business plan. And then uh, in our region, what we're seeing is a uh, lack of workforce. And that's where we can really come in and help uh, partner uh, developing uh, the workforce people that we need, uh, getting the community that we need to support that kind of business. Uh, as, I, as I said a minute ago, uh, what entrepreneurs, and, and my focus is on entrepreneurs, not so much on small business, but I think there's overlapping priorities here, but what entrepreneurs need to thrive is they need great new ideas and the talent and capital uh, uh, to pursue them. So echoing what, what my colleagues have said, it's, uh, it's workforce uh, readiness and it's access to capital. Uh, great new ideas stay in entrepreneurs' heads if they don't have those two resources. Um, uh, with regard to uh, funding of new businesses, uh, obviously with regard to small business, 
uh, community banks and their ability to uh, uh, thrive and do what they do best is incredibly important. And there are all, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about the implications um, uh, of Dodd Frank, for example, on on small and community banks. Uh, it's, it's my recollection, off the top of my head, that only uh, that new bank formation, uh, 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 the launching of new banks, has fallen to an 85-year low. Um, there's only been about three new banks launched since 2010. It's absolutely unprecedented in this country. Uh, the numbers of banks who are either failing or merging, more merging uh, with other banks to uh, uh, achieve some heft, uh, which makes it easier to deal with regulation like Dodd-Frank, um, means that there are fewer and fewer community banks and therefore fewer options for small businesses to go to. In the, in the context of angel investment and venture capital, you know, which are incredibly important for new businesses, uh, it tends to be very lumpy. I mean, venture capital rates, in terms of the amount of capital being raised and invested in recent years, is at record levels. But something like 80% of it is spent in either Silicon Valley, Cambridge, Massachusetts, or New York City. And everywhere in between, it's a desert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Next, I recognize Representative Radowagen for her five minutes of questions. Thank you, uh, Chairman Hulescamp and Ranking Member Chu. I too would like to welcome the panel. Thank you for being here today. Almost all businesses in my home district in American Samoa are small businesses. And um, Ms. Kincaid mentioned uh, the micro lending programs that could work very well, I think, in, in American Samoa. And there are some of them that are starting up. Uh, I have a question for you, Mr. Deary. Why has there been such a, a large number of startups in places like California, Florida, New York, and Texas? And how can Washington promote similar growth in the rest of the country? Uh, again, um, uh, at, the, at the risk of repeating myself, um, what, what entrepreneurs and, and new business formation uh, requires um, uh, is, is new ideas and the, and the capital and the talent uh, to pursue those ideas. There are certain parts of the country, um, uh, and, and you know what they are. It's, it's Silicon Valley, it's New York City, it's Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's Austin, Texas, Boulder, Colorado. There are certain areas of the city that have extremely effective and efficient ecosystems for entrepreneurship. They tend to be uh, characterized by having one or more uh, top universities uh, that, that are generators n not only of great new research but great new talent. Um, uh, uh, because they're generators of new talent and new ideas, they tend to attract capital. So you have another element of success there. Um, uh, the, uh, so uh, the question of what constitutes a really effective uh, entrepreneurship <coughs> ecosystem is one that, that is a subject of great debate. Um, and what uh, government can do to try to promote those kinds of circumstances elsewhere around the country is, is a very important one. It can be very tough uh, uh, for government to simply create ecosystems around the country, uh, but I think what they can do is they can uh, government public policymakers, uh, both uh, here in Washington and at the state and local uh, uh, level across the country, can promote the circumstances by which um, uh, talent and capital and ideas find each other. And, and if you look at the uh, proposals that I submitted in the appendix to my written testimony, there are 30 specific policy ideas there that, uh, that I think taken together can go a long way to promote the kind of ecosystems that you're talking about elsewhere outside of these traditional areas of entrepreneurship. Thank you, Mr. Deary. Nothing wrong with repeating. As you may know, the United States territories, particularly my home district of American Samoa, are both geographically and economically isolated, so thank you. Mr. Boyd, Please describe some of the challenges associated with making infrastructure investments with the limited resources of a smaller county, and do challenges keeping technology infrastructure up to date make it hard to attract businesses in rural areas? Very good question, ma'am. Thank you very much. It is a, it is a challenge. Uh, uh, we would like to have uh, high-speed internet to uh, all our citizens. We can't. We struggle with that. Uh, and that's uh, a lot of how the state and the federal government have uh, regulated the uh, disbursement of those rights. And certain uh, entities do not want to participate. Uh, the communities aren't uh, uh, populous enough for them to render a profit. We also uh, uh, work with economic development uh, groups in our county 
such as the uh, Manhattan Area Chamber of Commerce to develop uh, these uh, uh, innovative programs. Uh, I, I myself invest in an angel investment group with the, the chamber. Infrastructure, uh, the hard infrastructure, roads and bridges uh, are always a struggle because it, it links into the uh, national transportation system. We need help with those things. Uh, counties have 54 percent of all the bridges in the United States and they are in terrible repair. We know that uh, more than half are beyond their useful life. We have to address those. The FAST, FAST Act was a great program coming down to us, but it's only one step. We have a lot farther to go, so there are significant challenges. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for uh, participation and a uh, series of questions from my colleagues, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to discuss something uh, very critical to many of our districts and uh, indeed the entire country. I ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, so ordered, this hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>